Ask Brother Wesley if you would please open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us all very good things from everyone here safe tonight, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that we let ourselves go so we can receive your word. You bless this long service, Lord. And we ask you to be with us for the remainder of it. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you will, grab a song book. Let's turn to number 469. Wherever I go.
Let's go to the Lord with our burdens, our prayers tonight. I certainly remember uh, Brother Brian in this service that God would have his way. Uh, also, let's remember Sister Sarah Lovalski. Uh, she had young work and let's just pray that God would be with her and that healing to her. Are there any other spoken requests we need to mention, Brother Don? Nathan's traveling. Yeah. Okay, let's remember Brother Nathan. Any other spoken requests? I can't remember Sister Christine and Brother Justin, maybe. All unspoken with uplifted hand. I want to ask Brother Joe if you would please lead us in prayer. Gracious Lord, my Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you tonight, Lord God, for the opportunity to gather in your house, Lord. Yes. We pray, Lord, tonight that you would bring to us your word, Lord God, and you would bless us, Lord God, with that spiritual blessing, Lord. We pray tonight, Lord God, that you be with the people, Lord God, the prayer requests that went forward, Lord God, those that are sick, Lord God, in pain, we pray that you would touch them, Lord God, and give them relief, Lord, those that are traveling on the roads, Lord God, to keep your protecting hand upon them, Lord God, we pray that you be with those that couldn't make it tonight, yes. Lord God, that you would bless them as well, Lord God, be with each and every one of us in the remainder of the service, that your will be done in everything, Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to number 22. Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
sing all the believe. Man and woman 
which are one made out of the same blood, the same spirit, and everything else. Now I'd like to just stop <clears throat> for just a moment and not read past what we just read here. Because too many times we do not understand the thoughts of the prophet, what he's trying to tell us. And then because we don't understand, it seems sometimes it seems convenient why well, we'll just kind of skip ahead and keep moving on. But I think that's just our human nature because we don't quite understand something, we don't stop to reflect, we don't stop to pray, we don't stop to ask God, what does it mean? We just kind of keep reading on like we would a book. But that's not how we receive revelation. We receive revelation when we ask. He said, if you be any otherwise minded, he can reveal it to you. Now notice Brother Brown said, God manifested in Christ. And we don't have a problem with that. Nobody has a problem with that. The whole world doesn't have a problem with that. I think everyone agrees. So, no problem. But then he says, Christ manifested in the church. Here's where the, the line is drawn every time. Because people will not read what he said for what he's saying. This is where theology enters in to try to say, okay, this is what it means. This is where men set their ideas to what they think that this vindicated prophet is saying. And that's when the rub comes, because somebody is going to disagree. Now the full statement, again, is God manifested in Christ, Christ manifested in the church. And then he says, all together to bring back the original Adam and Eve again, man and woman, which are one, made out of the same blood, same spirit, and everything else. Then Brother Brown clarifies what he just said about the church. In the next paragraph, he says the church is the blood of Christ by the spirit, because the life is in the blood. Now, how many does it take to make a church? Wherever there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am in their midst, right? So it's not one person. It's the church he's talking about. And he says the church is the blood of Christ by the spirit because the life is in the blood. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that baptizes us into his body. So when he's talking about Christ manifested in his church, he's talking about the baptism in the believer manifesting the very person, the very life, the very character, the very attributes of the baptizer. Alright? That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that baptizes us into his body that recognizes only his body, his flesh, his word. Denomination won't ever touch that. It's a revelation. She knows it, but so did Eve know it. But she fell. But this one knows it, and it won't fail. She's ordained to it. Hallelujah. She's ordained not to fall. She won't fail. She's predestinated to it. Blessed is the man who God will not impute sin. You, you ministers know what I'm speaking of. Uh, when there's a couple dozen of you sitting here, see? Blessed is the man who God will not impute sin. That's David. All right. Now notice he speaks of an Eve who fell and an Eve who will not fall. So what's he talking about? He's talking about how God was manifested in Christ in the same way that Christ is to be manifested in his church. And as I said, everybody seems to have their own theological interpretation as to how Christ is to be manifested in the church. So we have two camps, basically, both split on this one. One camp believes that Christ is manifest in the church through one man. And then another camp says that God is manifested in his church through everyone. And then there's a truth to both of those statements. But each statement cannot be exclusive of the other. In other words, it is not just God manifested in one man. And it's not just God manifested in his church. It's God manifested in his body. Christ did manifest himself through one man, William Branham, in a greater display than he even did through God's own son, Jesus. In his sermon of the token, Brother Branham said, and if the life of Jesus Christ lives in the person, they become identified with him. It's Christ in you. Not a church member, not a system, but a resurrected power. It's the Holy Ghost is a token upon you that your life says amen to every scripture. Now, 
If you didn't catch what he's saying, he's not saying that you say amen. Too many of us, you know, we got mouths and we can say it and we can, like parrots, and we can repeat it. It's not what he said. He said that your life says amen to every scripture. So he's telling us that the Holy Ghost on display in you is not a system. It's not a church membership. It's a power. It's a resurrected power. So if it is a resurrected power, then it is the same power that was in the one who lived, died, and was resurrected. And he said the Holy Ghost is a token. It is an evidence that your life says amen. Your life says amen. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory, in the same dose. So he's not talking about theology. No. He's not talking about a mental recognition here. He's talking way beyond just your brain power. He's talking of a resurrection power in your life showing in your life that your life says amen to every scripture. You see, I, I've always said talk is cheap. Anyone can say that they agree in the Bible in their mind, but if you really agree, it will manifest in your life. Just because you say it doesn't make it so, Brother Brad would always tell us that. And just because you say that you are the righteousness of God, does not mean that you are the righteousness of God. I've got some really beautiful things to, to bring up tonight. <clears throat> Amen. But if your life reflects the very righteousness of God, then you can confess with your mouth, and it is the same statement with your body, with your mouth, that you are the righteousness of God. <coughs> you don't have to say it. Others will say it for you. The Bible says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. David said in Psalm 106 and verse 3, Blessed are they that keep judgments, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Now from the NIV, it's worded this way. Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Psalm 106 and verse 3, the Amplified. Blessed, in other words, happy and fortunate to be envied, are those who observe justice, treating others fairly and who do right and are in right standing with God at all times. And the New Life Version. Happy are those who are faithful in being fair and who always do what is right and good. And I'd also like to read from a new version that just came out. Remember a few years ago, one came out called The Message? Well, now they've got a new, a new version called The Voice. I think it's interesting the last two have basically message terminology. <laughs> But anyway, blessed are those who work for justice, who always do what they know to be right. Now let me get back to finish this quote from the token. I'm going to read the entire thing again. He says, and if the life of Jesus Christ is in you, in the person, they become identified with him. It's Christ in you, not a church member, not a system, but a resurrected power. It's the Holy Ghost is a token upon you that your life says amen to every scripture. The promise is written in there, and you're not yourself no more. You are Christ. You don't think your thoughts. You don't think your thoughts, he says. He says it twice. You say, well, I, I think you have no thought coming. The life that was in Christ is in you. The mind that was in Christ is in you. The works that was in Christ is in you. And Christ himself is in you. You are dead. And your life is hid in God through Christ. Sealed in there by the Holy Ghost. You're not even your own. That's our biggest problem. We think we are our own man. As Brother Bell used to tell a certain brother, he said, you're not an island to yourself. Whatever you do, whatever any of you do or say in here affects other people in here. You see? You see, the person who is righteous, it says he always does what is right. It is not hit or miss. It's not just doing more righteous one minute, well, then not so much righteous another minute, so that when the final tally comes in, you're weighed more on the positive side than you are on the negative. That's very Catholic thinking. And that's not what, what a righteous person is. A righteous person doesn't vacillate back and forth. A righteous person does, look, a righteous person, <clears throat> just because you say, well, I am the righteousness of God because the prophet said so, 
You're going to find out tonight that he didn't say it's for everybody. It's for those whose lives are righteous before God. Now, 1 John 3 9, whoever is born of God doth not commit sin. We know Brother Bell brought that out in Brother Bram's own church where it says who does, who, who, whosoever is born of God does not initiate sin. In other words, you don't go looking for it. <clears throat> but it says, for his seed, God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now listen, it says you not only will not initiate sin, but if, you're, if, you're, if that life that's living out of you is God life, it cannot sin. Brother Brad said, from future home. He said, see, the heart has to be cleansed like that before God can come down in the person of the Holy Ghost, which is Christ coming down and dwelling in the human heart. It first must be repented. It must be baptized in water in His name to show, show who it belongs to. Then it must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And then the Holy Fire and Holy Ghost from God comes down and burns out all the desire of sin, all the nature of the world, and therefore, he that sins willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, then again the Bible said it's impossible for a man that's born of God, he cannot sin. He does not sin. There's no way for him to sin. How can he be a sinner and a redeemed at the same time? How can I be in the pawn shop and out of the pawn shop at the same time? See? Oh, he redeemed us by his blood, by his spirit. He cleansed us and then comes to dwell in us, the church. Not the denomination, not the church. So how can a man be the righteousness of God and be a tool of the devil at the same time? Just because you say that you're righteous or you're the righteousness of God doesn't mean that you are. That's one of the things that bothers me so much when I hear people say that in this message. People stealing from others, people committing fornication, people who are out in all sorts of sexual perversity, people who sin against their neighbors, pull, big, uh, pull deals in companies, or pull deals on the places they work for, and yet call themselves the righteousness of God. In fact, well, I've seen men, I've seen women in this message who have not only broken every one of the Ten Commandments, but habitually break the Ten Commandments. And they say, well, Brother Brown said, I'm the righteousness of God. So I'm the righteousness of God. Who are you to tell me that I'm not the righteousness of God? And I'm just going to say, he wasn't talking about you. He was talking about those who do right are those who are righteous. Fools will walk with hobnail shoes where angels fear to trot. Now from his sermon, thy house, Brother Brown said, now I don't believe just because you say in your mind that you believe, I believe your life tells whether you're really a Christian or not. And from his sermon, questions and answers on Genesis, he said, he said, Brother, Brother Branham, what do you think about Pentecostals? And I said, that's the reason I'm dealing with them. That's the reason I'm fooling with them. They got something that you haven't got. I said, with their fanaticism and everything, they got a truth that you know nothing about. Now listen, with their fanaticism and everything that goes with the fanaticism, they still got a truth that you starchy, fundamentalist message believers know nothing about. I was talking to one of the greatest men in America right then. Yes, sir, he's the president of the Sudan missions. He's the greatest in all the world, fundamental to the core. He knows the scriptures and the death, the burial, the resurrection, just preaching like the house on fire, but that ain't it. The devil can do that. The devil's just as fundamental as he can be. But brother, Jesus Christ said, except a man be born of the Spirit of God, he'll never see the kingdom of God. Uh, not just because you say it. Oh yes, I believe that. Yeah, I, I believe that. That's the way I, I believe that. Yes, that don't do it. It's got to be an actual experience of the new birth. It's got to be something between you and God that you know that you passed from death into life. The problem is, when you're dealing as a pastor, when you're dealing with people, and you know someone is struggling because they don't have that experience with God, and you're trying to help that person to get an experience with God, then somebody comes along and says, oh, you shouldn't be searching like that. You're already born again when you're born in the world. You, you already come with the Holy Ghost. No, you don't, brothers and sisters. And the problem is, 
When somebody tells you you've got it and you know in your heart you don't, you're a hypocrite to listen to that. From birth pains, Brother Raphael, we know the old seed must, there, before the new seed can come out of the old seed, it must, it must rot. Absolutely, not die only, it's got to rot after it's dead. We know that to be true. That's the same thing in the new birth. We never go back but we go forward when you're born again. And that's why I think today that we have so many genuine, uh, and not, that we have not so many genuine new births is because the seed baby will sympathize with the word or with the person. But they don't want to rot away from the old system that they were in. They don't want to come out of it. They want to stay in the old system and claim the, the new birth or the message of the age. We found that under Luther, under Wesley, under Pentecostals, and all other ages, they still try to hold on to an old system and they claim this, but the old system age must die, it must rot in order to bring forth a new one. They still want to claim, notice, they, they know the old system is dead, but they just want to, to, but they just don't want to rot out of it. Now, rot is when it really is done away with altogether. I would like to ask every one of you individuals in here tonight, and you on the camera out there, wherever you're at, I would just like to ask you this question tonight. Have you ever looked to yourself in the mirror and looked right into your own eyes and say, I hate what I see. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And then fall on your face and ask God to change you because you cannot stand what you are and what you see in yourself. Because if you haven't done that, I doubt that you've been born again. And the problem is most of you are too busy with your living, living your life, your own lives, and there's a lot of you, uh, uh, you know, that you like. I mean, you still like, well, there's some parts of me that I don't like. Uh, well, I don't like any of it. Well, when a person dies, they don't partially die, do they? Can you selectively die? Well, I'm going to leave my earlobes because I really like my earlobes. I'm going to leave them, you know. I'm going to leave them a lot. Well, I kind of like my my left foot, you know. I think I'll leave him alive, and so they bury everything but the earlobe. I don't think so. It's a complete death, uh, death, complete burial. So if you haven't done that, I doubt that you've been born again. The problem is most of us don't hate everything about us, about yourself. You, you can't look in the mirror honestly enough to say, you know, you're a totally disgusting human being. And you've got to take, you, you, you've got to die. Because until you've done that, you haven't died. You can't be born again. That's the problem being raised in the message. I don't say it should be a problem. But it's a problem when you think, that, well, I've got the doctrine, therefore I'm okay. And then we find the young people just living all kinds of lives. But they think because, hey, we believe Brother Brandon, you know, it's a vindicated prophet. We believe Lee Bell is an indicated teacher. You know, then we've got it. And you don't. And you're only fooling yourself. And John said, John said, you know, he that, you know, he that says, I have no sin, only fools himself. You're not fooling anybody else. But when a person dies, not partially dies, but totally, totally dies, it's when they've gotten to the place where they're so sick and tired of themselves that they can't stand to live any longer with what they see. And they are so sick of themselves that they would just want to go hide. And then you know what it means to reckon yourself dead so that you can be hid in God with Christ. Brother Brandon said from the token, he said the token was not was not no good unless the token was displayed. The token had to be displayed, not a sympathizer with the token, but the token must be applied. And no matter how much anyone could prove that he was a Jew or a covenant Jew by circumcision, in other words, he's in the covenant, that didn't do anything about it. It took the token, not the covenant. Now listen... How many people say, I believe in predestination, I believe I'm predestinated. And living any old life, like a young man years ago, came to me after I preached Brother Bell's sermon on righteousness and unrighteousness. Tears in his eyes. 
He said, I've always believed that I'm God's elect. And I said, brother, and that I'm the seed of God. And I said, brother, I said, I don't care if you are elect seed. If you haven't been quickened, you're still dead. And you're not going to make it. Because if you are not quickened with Him, then the life that, then His life that raised Jesus from the dead, if that be not in you, He said, you're reprobate. He said, unless Christ be in you, you're reprobate. And if the very life of Christ that raised Him from the dead is not in you, you're reprobate. You've got to die. So that He might be in you. He's not going to live with just any old ordinary cuss. He's not going to have it that. But he said, but when I see the token, so today, you might be a professed Christian. You might be a covenant with Christ. But unless that token is displayed in this late hour that we're coming to, there is no way for him to pass over. The token must be displayed. It must be mine. <clears throat> like I said, people professing right in this message, they say, we were taught by Brother Branham, we were taught by Brother Vale to say that we are the righteousness of God and then living a filthy, cruddy life. I don't think so because if that is the righteousness of God, I simply don't want it. If that's the, all the better God can do for me, then I'd be just going from crud to crud. I don't want to live in crud. I want Him to live my life for me. So that I might be victorious. I don't care how much you tell yourself that you are the predestinated righteousness of God. Unless you died to yourself and have rotted yourself and have died and there were and, and then were filled with the Spirit, you are only fooling yourself and you are using theology to do it. Remember, religion is a covering, and so is theology. That is the biggest hindrance to the lives of the people in this message is theology. It's your camp mentality. Because you're looking at a camp. You're looking at something other than the very life of the one who died for you. And don't tell me people can't fool themselves with theology. I've seen some of the biggest misfits in this message complaining that they're the righteousness of God and living like scum buckets. Well, if that is the righteousness of God, who needs it? Is that, if that's all the better God can do who created a universe and that's all the better he can do who needs it? But my Bible says come out from among them and be you separate saith the Lord and then I will come in and sup with you and then I will be your God and you will be my son. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from, a, from among them, and be you separate. That means be willing to live a separated life, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now look, this is why so many are having trouble with believing that a supernatural God does supernatural things. I expect it from you, and you know what? I see it. Brother Brian expected it, and you know what? He saw it. Brother Bosworth expected it, and you know what? He saw it. Peter and John expected it when they saw it. All expected it. He saw it. And if you come expecting, Brother Brandon said, if you come prayed up and expecting to hear from God, you will hear from God. And you know what? You will go away seeing God manifest Himself in some way to you. I don't, I, I, I'm not smart enough to know which way, but that's between you and God. That's the way Brother Brown was. He saw, he saw God in everything because there was so much of God in him. That's why the people in Africa see, uh, see what you people here in the States aren't seeing. They come with an open heart expecting to see God move. 
And because they're expecting, God moves for them. But the only thing Americans would like to see move, I don't mean to be crude, but is their bobs. I don't say that to be funny. I say that, that Americans are more concerned with bowel movement than the movement of God. And it shows in their life. Put all their effort, all their energy into that instead of being moved by God. If God is here, then where are all the miracles? If He is still leading us to the millennium, then where is the evidence that He is still here leading? I see the evidence, and I'm happy with what I see. And some see it and they deny it. But why is that? Because you've been taught to be skeptical. And so you become skeptics. Because Brother Vale would talk about people would open the door and see the light go out in the refrigerator and make some type of a spiritual thing. And then people say, oh, well then if anything happens, I'm not going to even be flinched. Listen, a prophet of God Time and time and time again, coming into contact with God Almighty. And he gets in his car, and the wind stirs three leaves in a little whirlwind in the car. Okay. You and I would probably say, oh, that's just the car opening and shutting the door. He saw it as a God. You say, oh, you guys are getting Pentecostal, Brother Hales and Brother Branham, I'll Pentecostal with Pentecostal. He said, I used to think that he was a Baptist preaching to Pentecostal. He said, now, after listening to all these tapes, I realized he was more Pentecostal than the Pentecostals. So why aren't we? I'm not asking us to go around and shout and jump it up and down. I'm asking us to be stirred by the Holy Spirit. If you see the evidence, shout. But we've been taught to be skeptics. Wouldn't it be nice if you could all become so God-minded that you saw God in everything, like the old fisherman that Brother Brandon used to talk about? Remember the little boy who wanted to see God? Went to Mama, Mama said, no man can see God. Went to Daddy, Daddy, can you see God? No, no, so I don't think so. But go ask the Sunday school teacher, one Sunday school teacher says the same thing. So go ask your pastor. Went to the pastor and pastor, oh no, oh no. God is invisible, so no one can see God. So the boy was really discouraged because he wanted to see God. So the next day he went out with a friend, an old friend. He, uh, Brother Brown talked about this man who used to hang out, hang out at the Ohio River there. The man was so filled with the Holy Ghost. And so he took the boy out fishing and Brother Brown said the, the winds had come, you know, had gone, had come and gone. The, yeah, the night before it had rained and so the air was clear and everything else kind of painted a beautiful picture for us. And the young boy, as the old man was rowing up, they were going to go fishing, he looked at the old man and he said, Sir, can we see God? And he, with tears in his eyes, Brother Ram said, he said, Son, for the last 50 years, that's all that I see. Now, can you say that since you've been born again? That that's all you see? That's why Paul said, I don't want to see anything among you except Jesus Christ and He crucified. If there's only one attribute of Jesus Christ that I see in you, that's what I want to focus on. I don't want to focus on the other attributes that aren't His. That's where love covers a multitude of sins. Brother Branson from Doors of a Door, he says, so many people want to accept Christ as their Savior, but they say the days of miracles is past, so they don't want to believe that the days of miracles are now. Christ can't get into the heart. If Christ could gain entrance into your heart tonight, the heart of every person here, there would not be a feeble person among us in ten minutes. You say, well, that's because he had a gift. No, he's saying Christ. He's not talking about himself. If Christ could gain entrance to every one of your hearts right now, it's over. What's hanging up the rapture? It's certainly not him. Peter talked about the long suffering of Christ. If you know who it is, it's you and I. Brother Brown said, the faith is in you, but you, you're afraid to open up the door and let him be the Lord of that faith. 
you try to sympathize with a part of the Bible and you say some of it's right, but the other is not inspired. What causes that? Is perhaps maybe some person not knowing any different taught you that. All of the Word is inspired. And if we open up our hearts and open up our door, in our little room of faith, Christ can come in and He could become Lord. He will show great and mighty works and signs if you could only gain entrance to that part of faith. Why is it that we hear stories from Brother Vale throughout the years and Brother Branham about little old ladies praying food literally onto the table? And then someone stepped forward with a little bit of faith and they said they're trying to go back to Pentecost. Well, I think we need to go back to Pentecost because that's where we went off. And from God's provided place of worship, Brother Ram said, and that's what's the matter with the church today. We're full of theology without any dynamic in it. That's right, see? In other words, you've got to have the spark to the gasoline or the gasoline is not any good. It's no better than water. As long as it hasn't got a spark to fire it. So that's, that's, that's the way. No matter how well we're taught, how well we believe, and how much of the Bible that we say is true, and we believe it all is true, but it's got to be that dynamics has got to be there, the spark, to set that word of fire and make it start rolling. It's got to have that. And if you don't, the church sets still, and the car sets still, and you set still. But no matter how much you say, I sympathize, I believe every word of that, you've got to have something spark, spark that off to make that 100 octane go, go to firing and the big church of God to go moving on. It's got to take the dynamics with the mechanics. Nothing wrong with the mechanics, but it's lacking <clears throat> dynamics. And I think that's what's the matter with the church today. We're lacking that dynamical power to press this word and make it live for us today. Now we begin to close down here, and I just like to say, <clears throat> this is what Brother Brown says here in the token. He said that's what he was requiring that night to separate the believers from unbelievers. What was the token? What does the token do? It separates the believer from the unbeliever. Now notice what he's talking about. He's saying that there's this thing, he's talking about the token, will separate the very believer from the unbeliever. He's talking about applying the token. Now listen, the believer, worshiper, was identified with his sacrifice. He must apply the blood. He wasn't take and kill the lamb, set the blood out there somewhere, or keep it in a charger, but take it, or take it down to the neighbor. He had to apply the blood. That's the way it is tonight. We can come and sympathize with everything that God does. Now what does that mean? He's talking about here. We can come and sympathize with everything that God does. That is what He requires. You've got to apply it. It's not sufficient until you apply it. The blood must be applied. That shows that you are identified. The worshiper laid his hands upon the lamb and then killed it, identified himself <coughs> with the sacrifice. Now, in closing, let me just read a few more quotes here from the token. Now, now just look. Uh, excuse me. Now, now look. Just to believe it is not enough. Okay? To walk around where it's at is not enough. In other words, to believe he's here and to believe and, and actually to be in the presence is not enough. Those people that died in the wilderness, they were all under the pillar of fire. And they died. And they all believed that that was God. And he was there. And they died. You know what he says here? That isn't enough. See, that's to make yourself worse. To believe it and even be in it without this third thing, that's going to make you worse. For he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. See, those are borderline believers. Jesus spoke the same thing. He was the sixth chapter. For it is impossible for those who were once for all enlightened and have, have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant, wherewith they were sanctified, the chemistry there, sanctified, and it ain't the chemistry, it ain't the token. That's the, the blood's not the token now. 
The life is the token. The life could not be there because it was an animal. The chemistry was a token. You, 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 you'd have to have a little blood applied to the door, but now it's the Holy Spirit. We're coming to it just in a moment to prove that. See, it's the life that is in the token. Your life is gone and you are dead and your life is dead and you are hid in God through Christ and sealed in there by the Holy Spirit. The mind that was in Christ is in you and Christ and the Bible and the Word is the same. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Then you and the Word and God and Christ are the same. And if you abide in me and my Word abides in you, ask what you will. Now here's the thing. He said, it's not enough to hear it sit under a ministry that preaches it. It's not enough to say that I believe it. It's not even enough to be in the presence of it. But it has to be in you. Expressing itself through you. That's the seal. That's the seal. When He is living your life for you, then you know you're sealed in. That's beautiful. Put the power right into Moses' lips to go out there with the word and speak. Frogs come forth. See, speak. Frogs left. Speak. Lice come. Speak. Lice leave. Speak. Then from the token was required for all of Israel. All Israel was required of this token. And when I see the token, I'll pass over you. Oh my. What an assurance. Israel coming out of Egypt was a type of the antitype of today. Is Egypt was a church. And Israel represented the bride. And as Israel come out of Egypt, so does the bride come out of the church. See? Because there has got to be something there for it to come out of. And it's got to come out of that. See? So it was a type. The church is down in Egypt in the world and in sin and does not care a, a kicker about your token. They don't even believe it. But Israel loved it for it was salvation unto them. Uh oh It should make us be... It should make our heart... Oh, apply it, church. Don't, don't fail. Will you not? Don't, don't. Don't let the sun go down. Don't, 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 don't. Rest day or night. He's very fat. So don't. don't take no chance. It won't work, children. It won't work. You must have the token. You say, well, I believe. Yes, I go. Yeah, I believe the message. That's all right. That's good. But you must have the token. Do you hear around the cabinet? You must have the token displayed. Without it, all of your believing is in vain. See? You'll live a good life. You listen to what the Word says. You go to church. You try to live right. That's fine. But that's not it. When I see the blood, that's the token. What's the blood? It's the life. When I see the life, I'll pass over. And the token here is not because <clears throat> he had to see the actual chemistry then because the life had gone had gone from it. It was an animal. But here it is his own life that was in the blood. And the chemistry was only a sign of sanctification. But the life itself is a token. For without the circumcision, without the token, you're not even in the covenant. There's the answer to the people. Say, well, I'm predestinated. I'm claiming. He said, you are no longer church. You're a bride. That's me he's talking about. He says, you are the righteous seed of God. That's me he's talking about. So how dare anybody tell me I don't have the Holy Ghost? How dare anybody tell me that I need to get on my face and pray before God and get along with God? I don't need to do that stuff. I was born with the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah? I don't think anybody, except for John, maybe, who was filled with his mother's womb, was born with the Holy Ghost, and Jesus. Let me tell you something. I, I mean, I pray that they might be. But if you haven't died, You're not filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, He's not obligated. You're not in the covenant, He says. I'm going to read it again. Without the token, you're not even in the covenant. So all these people going around saying, I am the righteous of God, and they're out there living like devils. Or even if they're not living like devils, they're living like Pharisees. You know, talking about this one, putting this one down, and, and you know, always listen. Without the token, you're not even in the covenant. The whole thing works together. If you say that you're circumcised to the Word and, and it only, then you'll believe the Word. And if you believe the Word, then the token's got to come. For He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There you are, oh my. Again, from the token, says, and these signs shall follow them that believe, not just professors, but identified believers. They may not follow. They probably will, and perhaps they will, Jesus said. They shall follow them that believe. Just absolutely impossible for it not to happen. The works that I do shall you do also. That's the identification. Jesus' identification was to manifest the Word of God, which He was. And the church's identification today is to manifest the promised Word of this day by the same Spirit that manifested and quickened the Word back then. The same Spirit quickens the Word to the believer today and manifests the same thing, showing that the token is on the person, which is the resurrected life of Jesus Christ living in His believers. Oh, that ought to set a church afire and... and, and, and and that's true. Just as true as it could be. In closing, 1 John 5 and verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself. And the wicked one touches him not. Doesn't sound like he's saying it's okay for me to go out and drink. Because Brother Brandon did the works, I don't have to. It doesn't, that's not what it says here. It says, he that is born of God keeps himself. 1 John 5 and 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And in closing, 1 John 3 and 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. A lot of deceiving going on up there. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, God, is righteous. As far as the The gracious Father, we thank you, Lord. I just pray, Father, that each and every one of us tonight would tarry. That we would come to the place, Lord, on our knees before you until you fill us with your Holy Spirit. We take time for vacations. We take time to tend to our bodies of this flesh, but we don't take time for our soul. I just pray that each and every one of us, if we don't know for certain, That we've been cleansed by the holy fire of God. And that it's you living our life for us. And if we're not certain. Father I pray that you place upon our heart. To look into the mirror of the word and to see. To see what we're seeing. As Brother Branham said. You, see, you look back and see what Jesus did. And then compare yourself. Help us obey. We know that we live in the bodies of this death. We know there's struggle. We know these things. We know there's no perfection inside the resurrection. But we also know that the soul, the soul, cries out unto the O God. The soul panteth like the water brook, like the deer at the water brook. And my soul panteth after the O God. Fill us, O God, and we shall be filled. Help us, O oh God. Help us to come and just surrender all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that song, uh, I Surrender All. <laughs>
said, I sanctified myself that they might be sanctified. Help us to go forth tonight, Lord, as sanctified vessels. Sanctified not for our own sake, but for the sake of our brothers and sisters.